Alrighty, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Good to have you on the show. All of us are in the house today, which is absolutely fantastic. Unfortunately, we should have hit the record button about 20 minutes ago because we've just been riffing with so much uh, ideas and stuff and thoughts that we have now hit the record button and we're ready to go. But to introduce the show, I'm going to throw to you, Mr. Dorrington. No, I'm not. I'm not going to throw to you, Mr. Dorrington. <laughs> Mr. Huntingford, Mr. Huntingford, why don't you take us away in the intro? Good day, folks. Welcome to the Ecosystem Podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about the perception of low-code with pro-coders. Super exciting subject. We've had a number of discussions about this over the last two years. And I guess, you know, we need to start thinking about what is low-code really? And what do, maybe not even just pro-coders, but what does everyone think of it, right? Mark, you and I had a discussion with a certain bunch of folks yesterday talking totally. about where uh, where developers sit in the world and where uh, 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 enterprise architects sit and um, kind of the focus we need to give to them and, um, you know, how we really change the perception of what low-code is. So, yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing today. I like it. I like it. And this is, a, yeah, a, d a discussion that's probably been boiling for with all of us for the last two weeks. But I was doing some research this week into some of your work, Andrew, and... Um, I found in some of your back articles some really good points of view on this. One of the illustrations you gave um, was New Amsterdam and the New York map, you know, and brilliant storytelling, by the way. And I think for another topic, we need to get on to how to present well at events that is riveting, that attracts people to want to listen to your content, and that is no more than 18 minutes long because the facts show your presentation is uh, too wordy if it's more than 18 minutes long. Um, that aside, so one of these things that we've been riffing on, and and I, I even want to challenge Microsoft on this a bit, is that the concept in 2016 when the, the Power Platform came about, even though it wasn't labeled the Power Platform to 2019, it was this concept of low-code development or no-code development was also used you know, interchangeably, and this other phrase, citizen development, and I think that it has done a massive disservice to the enterprise nature of what the Power Platform really is. And I'm working with uh, a couple of accounts, and I won't say who they are, but I'll just say the seat sizing. So this one seat sizing is 44,000 premium licenses on the Power Platform. Another one is 220,000 premium licenses on the Power Platform. So they're big, right? And the thing is, they've all got these big license spends through their enterprise agreements. They've been put in place. Sometimes, not in these cases, the organization and a lot what goes into EAs, a lot of people don't even know that they own the software licenses on these. The problem is, if they don't consume those licenses, when renewal comes, out comes the red pen by the CIO or the <laughs> CFO, and they go, eh, we're not using that, and they cross these things off. Now, Microsoft, in my observation, they don't want a license type to be swapped out on an EA. They want that EA to grow, not to stay static, but year on year, an EA or at renewal should get larger, not stay the same. They don't want all the premium power platform licenses to be swapped out, for example, with co-pilot licenses, because it's kind of like there's no delta, right? There's no change. And so with this in mind, I come back to that story one, from a, and this was a Scott Durrow post a couple of weeks ago on um, how does a developer get onto the Power Platform. And what I realized is back in the day when we had XRM before Power Platform, we had a set path of if you're a .NET developer, this is how you could onboard and get really good at uh, using back then the XRM platform to build solutions, which is, of course, now the Power Platform Play It Forward. We have a much more enterprise-scale platform. A mu the automation on what we have now compared to what we had with Windows Workflow Foundation is just at an epic proportion. Logic apps, epic proportion. Um, service bus, what we had to deal with back then. What was it called, the service bus tool on-prem? Um, I forget. BizTalk, yeah, yeah, BizTalk. BizTalk, BizTalk server, yeah. Back then, the, the, the jobs of integrating was just like, so difficult. What we have now is amazing. Yet, we've relegated from an enterprise architecture perspective, I think they look at the Power Platform and say that is for the children to do some personal productivity stuff. That is not an enterprise play. We'll use it strategically. We'll build one app, maybe two, 
but this is not a core platform. This is not an SAP. This is not a PEGA. This is not a fill in the blank enterprise piece of software where, so they use it tactically, not strategically. And so hopefully I've set the scene there for a discussion to go, how do we fix this so that the power platform is really used again for enterprise applications and is used at scale because we know we know from our experience that it absolutely meets those requirements, but I don't believe the market does. I believe we've been having this this discussion or this fight for years and years and years. I myself didn't understand it. Even when it was XRM, if you were a developer, you were classed as a lower level developer if you started writing some plugins because you've not written that that piece of functionality from scratch or you're doing is a class how do you mean unless you build like libraries on top of libraries and write things from scratch you're not a real developer so for me the way um i gained adoption you know for myself for low code as it you know within the xrm platform well, it was money. If you wanted to apply for a .NET <laughs> job, you had a certain salary. If you wanted to apply for a job playing with toys for kids, not being a real developer, da -da 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 -da, only writing a bit of JavaScript, only putting in some, you know, plugins or custom workflow activities, your salary was higher by 20%. Why do you think that is? Why do you think, you know, even to this day, actually being able to customize the platform and if you can write a, a little bit of code on top of it, even better, it's just valued better. Business value, right? It's time to value is so much quicker. Right. Business value. Exactly. But I could also tell you that people people need knowledge. Like if you, that that's a good point, Anna, but like, it's kind of like, can you build a house? Is building a house from scratch easier than building on top of, um, you know, a current construction? And actually, you need to have a lot of knowledge of the platform underneath and, and how the classes work and how the APIs work and that. Yeah. And that's why people get paid more. I can categorically tell you that, like, building something from scratch is actually a lot easier than having to build on something else because you need to have that foundational, fundamental knowledge. Yeah, but what people understand is that you never, ever build from scratch anything. There's no greenfield, ever. This, though, I think there, there's a, it, this is an, a, an interesting and related issue, right? Where if, I, I still see a lot of folks today who come from a dynamics background where they see something that maybe matches the dynamics use case 20%, and they say, all right, we're going to go customize the bejesus out of dynamics rather than actually using the platform and the umpteenth microservices that we have available to us. We're just going to go customize the dynamics application. And I tell people, listen, if that dynamics application is not a, at least an 80, preferably a 90%, 90. Fit, yeah. a 90 fit for the use case, dynamics is not the way to go. Build custom with Power Platform, and then I get this look like, like you can build custom with Power Platform, <laughs> which is bizarre that we don't know this yet. Um, but we, but yes, yes, you can. That's why I said in Amsterdam, right? Dynamics three six five is dead. Long live the Power Platform. The reason I said it is that it was a I was on a hackathon with Chris in London, and I had a group. It was Purple Team. And it was yeah. a bunch of consultants at New Dynamics and the Power Platform was in play. And the first discussion after they decided what the solution was, which which Dynamics product would we use to build it? And I was just like, <laughs> it is none of these. what the hell? None, none of them are a fit, but you've got, back then CDS, now Dataverse, you've got that, you can build, I mean, the, for the years that we asked for a platform skew back in the XRM days, it <laughs> was headless, right? Don't give us any of the Dynamics bullshit. 
I, I love Dynamics, by the way. I built my career on it. Um, but <laughs> just give me the core platform and let me build what I want, right? Because I spent years creating stuff on, like, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. In, in West, in WA, which is called West Australia, right? It's, uh, it's 11 times the size of the United Kingdom. I built with my team an asset management system of the entire roading bridge lighting infrastructure of that, right? We're talking about massive, 11 times the size of the United Kingdom. And we built it on Dynamics 365 sales. Yeah. Now, do you, do you, do you know there was, which is what sales is today, which was Dynamics CRM back then, right? Do you think we had any need for a customer record or an account? No, we were creating service orders for damages to the infrastructure right across that state. But Mark, this goes back to the, what we were talking about with with the understanding of uh, a, a technology ecosystem, which is a lot of architects, even down to to consultants, will only understand a certain tech stack. So if all you've got is a hammer, everything's a nail, and it, yeah. exactly the dynamics path that you just you discussed there, which is we know dynamics, we know how to customize that. They haven't quite made the connection that actually you can start from scratch, and you know that really well too. Yeah, I think that you know I. I'm going to go back to um, uh, CRM 4, CRM 2011, the godforsaken CRM 2013, 15, 16 era, which was which was terrible. Let's try and copy Salesforce era all the way through. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we actually just modernize the 2011 interface and call it a model-driven app, and there you go, that's the day. But I think... For me, there's a lesson in that era. And, you know, Mark, like you, I, I built, I built applications. My, my team and I built applications that on top of Dynamics CRM that had nothing. I mean, even further, we're talking apps that ran air terminals at the South Pole or mm, human mm, resources mm. for the military or that ran, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And we were always doing our best to hide the functionality of sales so that you wouldn't, the user wouldn't have to interact with it. And the lesson to me here for your original question, though, is that back then, architects and developers, we were thinking about CRM as a really great data service that allows us to build the app that we need quicker, right? And in this weird sort of, I don't know if it's reverse psychology, but the psychology of it is certainly strange, right? When power platforms started to drift away from being, you know, at its core, the core value is the data service. And when it started drifting more into the build the Canvas app, and I don't want to take anything away from what building that Canvas app made possible, but I think that it weirdly... Reorient, even though the data service has improved by leaps and bounds, it reoriented the technology away from being a data service that helps developers move faster to being an app service that helps non-developers build toys. And the psychology of that is strange, and it's going to take us still years to, to unpick. But, dude, that's also down to marketing. That's also very much down to marketing. Yeah, yeah bro, I think that... um. You know, when you look at the way that this whole thing was put out, like you have Mendix, OutSystems, Lightning Platform, um, all these tools, right? And the way that they, they pitch themselves, I mean, look at Mendix, right? Like Mendix were very good at pitching SitDev. OutSystems tried it, but they sucked, okay? But the whole idea is that I think Microsoft tried that. And the other thing that they did is they bolted it into Microsoft 365 as a business productivity tool. Yeah. So if you're going to bolt something into Microsoft 365, it's going to get treated like a Microsoft 365 tool. So, and that, but that's how Power Platform got its branding. It's got its name. I mean, if you listen to the stories, um, a certain person calls it Power Apps apps or Power Apps platform. Anyway, we won't talk about that or um, PowerPoint apps. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Do, do you remember what... someone at a conference once tried to give a presentation and yeah. refused to use slides and wanted to build a Canvas app, which interesting engineering but this is it dude this is what happens if you if you treat it's like saying if you treat it like that it's going to get yeah. it's like calling everything an app right if you call it an app it's going to become an app and it's never just an app there's yeah. so much more and i think that's what's happened with power platform is that perspective and the way the messaging has come out has been incorrect yeah 
Chris, we even had um, targets, sorry, but at Microsoft for power apps. And we were like, what? Yeah, I remember. How can one like do, what, what, what is even that? So it wasn't even treated as a whole, it was like power apps. How many power apps? It's like, no. But that's when you start realizing the, the, the relationship between trying to target a business number and b having a very aggressive sales team that is cutthroat to get there and actually aligning the correct technology in the correct way to your clients. You know, and that's why sometimes when I see companies and, and actually, Anna, this is something you and I uh, come up uh, against occasionally, which actually it's the reverse where they don't have any system developers, but actually it's kept within their pro dev team and only they're allowed access to it. And actually they shut down anything else. Away. And you go, well, I, I wonder how that's going. Oh, it's it's going really well. And I, I you know, I'm for business users yeah. to use it appropriately. But I actually do like when I see that approach because, you know, their their maturity towards adoption is significantly higher. The, the constituency that I care the most about in an organization using Power Platform, this is not to say, don't go back and find a clip of me saying that Andrew doesn't care about citizen developers, but the <laughs> constituency I care the most <laughs> about are professional developers and architects, right? Because those are the ones who are building the solutions Correct. that are going to become strategic the fastest. And that, to me, is the real power of the platform. That's spot on. Let me give you an example and tell me if this resonates or if I've got this wrong. I'll talk about, uh, I won't say the customer, the customer was a, um, a federal government customer um, uh, that was around border security in Australia. Okay, so it's pretty clear who okay. it was. All right. Okay. And, and. Th thank you for not making this about the United States. That's all. I'm, I'm very grateful. Yeah. So you can imagine the CIO, when they're going to make a, a decision around building something and introducing new technology into the ecosystems that they have, whose advice are they going to take? They're going to look at their senior enterprise architect and generally in, in a large organization that will have an S on the end, right? They will have a discussion and they will make a decision. And depending on the size of the organization, you have to check whether those senior architects are on somebody else's payroll. And, and what I mean by that is that let's say an IBM has a consultant in there or a PwC or whoever has seen you consult and they're full time in those roles inside the organization. Now, in the IBM situation, this is before I worked for IBM, right? The situation was that the entire organization was run by IBM mainframe architects. And when we introduced this way of building a rapid solution to protect the borders and create an evidence trail for the Australian Federal Police um, on criminal activity, guess what they said? Microsoft's not enterprise, Microsoft's not it, there, there be danger, you know, the old saying, <laughs> there be dragons there, right? The fear of, of like, this is not of a scale. So the CIO said, listen, can you build this solution? How long will it take you to build? I said, well, that's probably about a two and a half year project for us to build that. In fact, we're going to adopt PEGA and we can do it in about two and a half years. They asked me, how long can we do it? I said, I reckon we can do it in six months, worst case, eight months, right? And this sure. is what the power yeah. platform gives you, right? If you look at the size of a project, and if you look at the total economic impact report that Microsoft did a few years ago with Forrester, yeah. they showed that a $75,000 project was generally 50% cheaper to do on the power platform, or a $250,000 project was generally around 70% cheaper to do on the power platform. So it does give you this rapid development framework to work properly. with. If and it accelerates. Properly. Yeah, but listen, just going back to the point I wanted to land there was the enterprise architects are advising the CIOs, CTOs uh -huh. about which way to go. And listen, I just was with another major bank recently, and they said, if that guy doesn't give it the green light, our conversation's over. Because that executive is not going to put their body part on the line and make a call over somebody that technically knows apparently what's safe and what's not safe for the organization right and so i come back to there needs to be a massive re-education that comes from microsoft around the enterprise scale of this platform the need to educate enterprise architects around the solution so that they talk to the cio cto and 
give it the you know this is this is a strategic part of our ecosystems going forward but then that brings us back on to what i mentioned when we uh when we hadn't hit record which is has this been named inappropriately when we talk about low code in general because we and, and we could tie a few things together here uh anna start i believe it was anna uh who stated that actually you, you weren't seen as a professional developer if you started absolutely using, but then should we say if you're not doing it all in binary code or ascii or something else then you're not over true because that's what happens we evolve and we put layers upon layers upon layers democratization has existed for years it hasn't just existed for low code every high code language is actually a democratization of what it was before and what mm. it's engaging with so quite frankly when i look at low code and i look at some very complex scalable uh pro dev extensibility canvas apps as well as model driven apps as well as power automate you would never be able to give that to a sit dev and you could never say it was low code it is entirely complex so yeah i throw that out to you all my lovely friends will i think about this i think about my my best friend in the world a brilliant guy he's not he's not a technologist <laughs> he's a pediatrician um i'm gonna have drinks with him thank on god later tonight that yeah, thank he god. is a pediatrician <laughs> so useful advice for future parents go befriend a pediatrician but yes. in any case, I'm going to have drinks with him later tonight, and it's going to be drinks on Teams because we live 3,500 miles apart. And um, on my end, I'm going to be speaking with him using a modern, beautiful laptop. On his end, he's going to be speaking to me using a beige metal box that he built, right, with his own graphics card, with his own power supply, his own motherboard. He wired the whole thing up. And I used to do that, too, right? Like... For the, if you're if you're a long time geek like us, probably lots of us used to do that, right? But I tell them all the time, I'm like John, it's not worth it. <laughs> just, you're you're you you're not, you're not a gamer. You're just it's just not worth it, bro. <laughs> you're insulting Mark. <laughs> you know he says, do, do you know what he says to me every time? He he says yes, but I want to be able to control it without having to rely on a major technology vendor. I'm like, yeah, okay, okay, you do you, do you because, because yeah. clearly, yeah, yeah. That's actually a great point. That's actually a great point. People want to be able to control things. Remember the war when we started moving CRM as it was back then to the cloud and everyone was super outraged that you're not oh, going to yeah. be able to access the SQL database. Yeah. Oh. Which they were never meant to access. They shouldn't have Which been they doing it to access. <laughs> so can I, so I got a story for you guys. When I, I was giving a, I was giving a presentation at a conference. It was the Power Platform World Tour, Washington, DC, I think it was in 2019. On a Tuesday afternoon. On a, no. You know what? It doesn't matter. The details don't matter. <laughs> it was raining and it was safe. <laughs> and it was very flying. <laughs> the adjectives keep on compounding. But, right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> and I, was, I was extolling the virtues of the common data service, CDS, we called Dataverse at the time. Mm -hmm. And there was a woman in the room who raised her hand and she said, Well, I just don't. I could never use Dataverse. And, um, she and we are like, okay, well, why don't you tell it did what a presenter does when I asked some mm -hmm. questions and her, her mm -hmm. response was, well, I can't ever move from on premise XRM because in Dataverse, I can't do the stored procedures. And you could have heard a pin drop in the room. And what was really interesting is that people who knew what they were talking about, it's like their heads rotated like Stewie's head <laughs> from Family Guy to look at this person. And then we all just sort of took a moment. And then I went back to present. I went back to doing what I was doing because I thought, I'm not going to convince you. I'm just I'm yeah. moving on. But, exactly. But, but, moving on. This comes back to just the basic principles of change management, which is if we were left to <laughs> our own devices, we'd still be chimpanzees. I I, yeah. I know we would be. We wouldn't evolve because we've always done it this way, and it's how yeah. we like doing it. Yeah. Change management is another great podcast, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why people but that's the the point is people love control love, uh, uh, and w which which is fine and now we've got tools and everything but because the reality is when we started saying citizen developers you know everyone can do their own thing and then we started like showing use cases where people have done so and 
all of a sudden, not only we found hundreds of canvas apps all over the place, but, you know, some cities and developers became crafty. Yep. Like you had model-driven apps in the default environment. You had custom connectors that nobody knew what they did and what sort of data shifted outside of the organization. So whilst it, you know, it is the, the whole low code concept, like Will is saying, is doing such a disservice because not only people don't take it seriously, not believing it, this is not an enterprise solution, an enterprise scale solution, but also others who find out how to use it can cause real damage. Yep. Look at look at implicit connectivity into data. My favorite thing in the world. Like some some person, some genius gets access to a SQL data structure, mm. generates an implicit connector up to it. It's like the old SA one two three four five password. And oh my gosh, why has everyone got access into my data? And you know, it's it's wild, right? Like there's so many loopholes, but there are loopholes in every piece of software that you'll ever use. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's why EA struggle with this stuff. And it's not like you're looking at a pe like Pega as a platform, right? There's lots of moving parts, but it's a platform. This thing connects out. It's got arms into every part of Office and every part of Azure. Yeah. And that's the thing that I think people freak out. And, you know, when you guys, Anna and Andrew, when you shared that ecosystem architecture that you built, showing how the neighborhoods worked and that, which, by the way, is by far my favorite slide to present ever, it gives people an idea like it gives an idea of what it can do, but it really goes so much deeper. And EAs do not get that depth, mm. I don't think, at least. So to to wrap, because we're at the three minute wrap mark, we've kind of expanded on a, a concern, a problem that we've identified. What I'm keen to hear now: what are potential solutions? How could we address this in the next six, twelve, eighteen months? Do people have resources out there that they use to take a .NET developer, and it could be X type of developer could be Python developer, whatever it is, to being very proficient on the Power Platform. Does anyone have a tailored path? How do we convince Microsoft of the need to do a shit ton of marketing to rebalance the ship? And I'll just throw out one other thing. It just clicked on me the other day. You know what Canvas apps are? And I know they're not, but they are. They're just info path forms that just took off, right? at the end of the day and became the main thing. Let's call them what they are. They're fucking InfoPath 2.0. Now, I, I, I say that I say that tongue in cheek because I've got some beautiful uh, Canvas apps um, that are still back into Dataverse, but it was, it was just a, a thing that dawned on me this week that it's InfoPath 2.0 is a Canvas apps that we've been told is going to save the world in the, the Power Platform, and I don't think they're the primary thing to index on. Oh, no. No, not at all. I think you're right. I love the fact that you've mentioned, though, that they're hooked onto a Dataverse backend. And that is, like, that's very important. As you know, I tried to do an enterprise app using SharePoint. It just did not work for me. As in, the, the ALM around SharePoint is, yeah, I think the facial <laughs> said it all. I'm literally not going to comment on that. I've already been in trouble this week or it will being rude about SharePoint. Is SharePoint is dead.af actually? No, alive? no. Share, SharePoint is amazing. You know where yeah, SharePoint is amazing It is at? amazing. When you add syntax over it, when you add um, AI automation over documentation, next level, amazing, absolutely amazing. I want to be clear. I want to be clear. What I was what I was asking is there used to be a domain that I registered. It, it's an Afghani domain extension because it's .af, <laughs> and it was called SharePointIsDead.af, and it pointed to Chris Huntington's Huntingford's <laughs> Twitter profile. But I let the registration lapse because Afghani domain names are expensive, man. Are they really? Yeah, they, weirdly costly. Do you think the opium trade would be uh, covering everything? You know? <laughs> Sub subsidizing SharePoint is dead AF. And on that note. The real trade is domains, really. That's the yeah. difference. <laughs> <laughs> so have we got a solution just as we wrap? Any solution ideas to solve this quandary? Well, it's, it's, it's as all things. It's Microsoft's marketing machine will always bring 
uh, bring a nightmare of different uh, issues to us. Think about what it's done to those three little letters, COE. You know, it's we can no longer use that without talking only about tooling now, when actually Centre of Excellence has been around for years, but yet that is now gone. We have to use a different language for them. And then the next stage is just education. We need to educate professional developers that actually it's a highly scalable, um, highly flexible and very secure solution and I will set of tools to build your solutions. And until we've got those two things going, it's going to always be us having very strong and similar conversations with our clients when they say, well, our pro dev communities haven't quite brought into it. We have to go, OK, let's do this then. Let's get the slide deck up. Let's get the engagement plan sorted and let's spend some time because if your pro dev community aren't using it, you won't see the proper value. And then you'll blame it on the tooling and then it will go into the same box as PowerPoint, Word and Excel. And I think we also need to uh, use the whole thing. Stop referring to just a piece of it. Stop trying to sell Power Automate. It's not a thing. Start showing people in their own Azure portals, these professional developers or like security engineers, cybersecurity, database admins, doesn't matter. Let's start showing them our platforms right there. Exactly like, <laughs> like Chris said, it's everywhere. Yeah. So it, you you have to know it or else. Mm. Yep. I agree. I think that um, you're absolutely right. I, I can't stand the word app. I've actually abolished it internally. I'm like, it's a solution because it's yeah. more than, it's never just one little thing. There's lots of pieces to it. So yeah, I just wish that people would see the propensity about roping into the wider parts of my of Azure and, and looking yeah. at all those wonderful things it can do. Andrew, what were we going to say? No, I was, I was, I was just going to say that, you know, I think that, that I do know people out there, five of them are on this podcast, right, that are doing some of the heavy lifting, right, to get folks and to get organizations to start thinking of the technology in this way. You know, there's only there's only so far that individuals and, say, an individual enterprise architect or an individual CIO or an individual cloud strategist can take this. I think that you know, one thing that occurs to me is that I would love to see Microsoft kind of package all of the power platform tools, the developer tools, the studio tools, right, into some sort of, you know, solution studio and link to it directly from the Azure portal, right? Just mm. put it in front of, put it in front of developers who, you know, are are playing in with, with Azure services and make it available to them. Those are the little sort of changes at the margins, but, um, you know, it, it's going to take a lot of work to do. Kill a COE starter kit, move it all into managed environments so we stop using that word like a swear word and have to explain it to every customer. You don't have a center of excellence. You've turned some tools on that's called COE starter kit, and then you have to explain what starter means. It's just like, what a waste of time. Managed environments, the beauty is nobody knows what managed environments is. No one has a preconceived what managed environments is. It's freaking amazing. Every, yeah, yes. But then you've got this whole thing, which is another, I know I'm meant to end my own show here at this point, but here's the other thing that we need to unpack, is the value of premium outstrips all the legacy BS you create by using freemium. Yep. Oh, right? God. I agree. There's just oh. a whole story that needs to be unpacked there. I see people that, I look at them, another government agency in New South Wales recently, and they're like, they are ahead of a lot of people. And I go in and it's 99% free. And they're like, we're wanting to do that. Yeah, it's all available there. It's, you got to do, you got to pay for it. Oh, I don't want to pay for those licenses. I mean, the, the, the software economics story could not be overemphasized for the next 18 months to rewrite the ship and the value of premium, the true TCO of premium over farting around with the, the freemium, non-premium licensing model. Uh, let's see where we go on that one over the next little while. I'll, I'll leave it with that. We would love your feedback, by the way, if you're listening to this, watching this. Honestly, jump on the LinkedIn thread and abuse us. Tell us where we, what we got wrong. If you're Microsoft and you're listening, we're open to conversations to, uh, <laughs> you know, write the next narrative and how we really scale us in the enterprise. And Mark, as we as we wrap this up, have we told everyone about Dynamics Minds and the Ask Me Anything that the five of us are doing at oh, Dynamics Minds? Yeah, tell us, tell us, Andrew. The five of us will all be together in person for the first time in years, and certainly since we launched the podcast. 
at Dynamics Minds in Slovenia, uh, which is one of the very best Microsoft conferences of the entire year. Uh, and we'll be doing an Ask Me Anything panel. We won't be recording, but it'll be basically a live podcast. Yeah, May the 27th or the 29th, right? Please come. Have you guys had your cartoon photo, you know, images done? Yes. You know that they're putting up, you know, that that the Dynamics Minds oh, no. folks, they put up the, um, you know, guess who this person is. Uh, they, they've got some awesome graphic artists that oh, are I doing, like, on LinkedIn. Well. And um, I was like, this stuff is cool, man. It's such a cool way to promote the event. So they have this whole kind of guess who the person is, and it's a caricature of an individual. And then a couple of days later, they release the photo and the caricature, and you're like, yeah, I can see that. They are epic. They're epic. Make sure you get yours if you can. Of um, I reached out behind the scenes and said, um, where's my one? And it got sent to me, and I, I love it. Oh, um, wow. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll go check this out. Yeah, go, go check it. <laughs> Alrighty, I'm going to hit the stop button. Thanks, everybody. Ciao, ciao. Thanks, Thanks all. Bye.